Part 3. The Mythology of Ancient Italy Introduction For the very good reason that the Italic mind and religious attitude were quite unlike the Greek, it is impossible to treat the mythology of the Italic peoples as we have considered that of the Greeks. Now, the mind of the Italian was not naturally curious and speculative, whence, since speculation is the motive power behind myth, the output of Italic myth was very small, and at the same time well nigh barren of lively fancy. Furthermore, the Italian had not advanced to a stage of religious thought which would of itself favour the creation of a group of divine personalities specially adapted even for such imaginary genealogies and stories of marvellous ach achievement as his type of mind might be able to construct under certain circumstances. What, then, was the nature of his religion? We shall endeavour to compact a description of it into a paragraph or two. Up to a point about midway between the animistic grade of religious thought and the stage of belief in personal divinities, the Greek and the Roman seem to have developed in virtually the same way. Beyond this point, however, the lines of their progress diverged. For while the Greek mind easily and naturally emerged from animism into deism, as the moth from the chrysalis, the Roman found the utmost difficulty. And, indeed, so awkward was the metamorphosis that the great majority of the deities which it produced were and remained stunted and deformed as compared with the Greek divinities. In brief, the Roman seldom got further than to regard the potency or life power as a living will, a noumen, as he termed it. Only the barest few of the noumena did he endue with the many-coloured coat of personality. All others he left in the plain rustic garb of functional spirits of nature. The assignment of names to the favoured few and the establishment of their worships and priesthoods in definite localities added to the illusion of their personality and the popular mind. Although from the point of view of our classification, the noumena were scarcely gods, yet for the practical purposes of Roman private and public religion, they were as much deities as were, for instance, the nobler figures of Jupiter, Eno and Minerva. By reason of the power of the gods to help or to harm, it was to the best interest of the Roman to keep on good terms with them. In his own words, to secure and maintain a Pax Deorum. And accordingly, every act of his worship was directed to this end. By rites, largely magical in character, by sacrifice, and by supplication, he strove daily to ensure for himself, his family, his fields and flocks, and his state, the favour of the benevolent divinities, and to avert the displeasure of the evil. But the fixed system of ritual which he evolved in a very early period so mechanised his religious thinking that he became incapable of imagining his gods as departing from the traditional conception of them, and hence was equally unable to invent myths. In the dearth of Roman myth, the Latin writers from Livius, Andronicus, onward, were forced to draw for their literary material on the abundant store of Greek poetry, and when the poetry naturally went the Greek gods and the Greek mythology, although, in order to make the character of these beings in intelligible to Roman readers, the author had to equate or identify them with those of the accepted gods of the land whom they resembled most closely. In some instances, they made use of identifications ready-made in the popular belief, whence it came about that, for instance, Zeus was always represented by Jupiter, Hera by Juno, Artemis by Diana, and Demeter by Ceres. Practically, all the myths of pan-Hellenic currency became common Roman property. Only the narrowly local ones were untouched. Assuming this, we can read the Greek myths of our preceding pages as Roman, if only we take the pains to change the names of the gods to those of their Roman equivalents. 1. 
Etruscan mythology. Unhappily, we are unable to distinguish with exactness the Etruscan contribution to Roman religion, although Roman writers definitely labelled a few myths as from this source. According to an Etruscan cosmogony, the Creator appointed twelve millenniums for the acts of creation and assigned to them severally the twelve signs of the zodiac. In the first millennium, He created heaven and earth. In the second, the firmament. In the third, the land, sea, and lesser waters. In the fourth, the sun, moon, and stars. In the fifth, the creatures of air, earth, and water. And in the sixth, man, whose race was to endure for the remaining six millenniums and then perish. A myth attributed the origin of the Etruscan religious system to a child named Tegis, who took human form from a cloud thrown up by a plough and in song delivered his holy message to a wandering throng. The nymph Begoy was said to have revealed the so-called sacred law of limitation to Aaron's Beltiminus, while Mantis is recorded as the name of the Etruscan god of the underworld, and Volta as an appellation of a mythical monster. 2. Native Italic Gods A. Nature Gods Of the Sky, Atmosphere and Time Jupiter Jupiter or Iovis, Diovis, Dias or Diaspiter The chief god of all the Italic stalks was a personification of the sky and its phenomena being therefore rightly identified with Zeus. His control over the weather and light made him of necessity the all-important divinity of a nation of shepherds and husbandmen, and his might was manifested in the thunder, lightning and rain. In fact, legend reported him as coming to earth in bodily form with the thunderbolt. This is the origin of his epithets fulgur or lightning, fulman, or thunderbolt, and doubtless also of Phyretrius, while as the rain god he bears the name Pluvius, Pluvialis, and Elysius. From his lofty seat in the heavens he could behold all that happened upon earth. Hence, as Terminus, he became the guardian of boundaries between properties, and, as Dias Phidias, the witness of men's fidelity to their oaths. Only a few of the Roman gods became thus moralized. Mater Matuta Mater Matuta was the deity who, in the words of Lucretius, at a certain hour brings down the down through the tracts of air and diffuses the light of day. But she was also a divinity of birth, and in these two capacities was likened by the Greeks to their Leucothea and Eletheia, respectively. As the former, she became a goddess of the sea and of sailors, while Melikertes, or Palaimon, the son of Leucothea, was likened to the Roman Portunus, or protector of harbours. The gods of the seasons were few. The explanation suggested by the ancients to account for the significance of the goddess Angerona are childish and she seems really to have been, like Anna Perenna, a divinity of the winter solstice. As protector of plants through all their stages from blooming to fruit-bearing, Vertumnus was perhaps aboriginally a god of the changing year. Ovid relates that, in the days of King Proca, Vertumnus fell in love with Pomona, a shy nymph, who withdrew from the society of men to the retirement and duties of her orchard and garden. And although in many disguises he sought to make his way into her retreat, it was all in vain, until he presented himself in the form of an old woman. He then told her of his passion, but all his words could not avail to soften her heart. Only when he showed himself to her in his true likeness, as a youth of unblemished beauty, did she relent and from that time on they were never seen apart. B. Nature Gods 
of human life, earth, agriculture, and herding. Genius, Iuna. If we adopt the Roman point of view and regard the genius of man and the Iuna of woman as functional powers originating outside of human life and employing men and women merely as fields of operation, we must place these two divinities among the nature gods. Fundamentally, genius was the procreative power of each man, and Iuno that of each woman. Whence, finally, through a logical expansion, the names came to stand severally for the two sexes and their respective life interests. The ramifications of man's activities rested the development of genius as an individual noumen, while the restricted sameness of woman's life intensified the individuality of Iuno. In genius, however, was latent the germ of the man-worship of the empire. Iuno presided over the conception of children and their development up to birth, while her Samnite epithet, Populona, marked her as the divinity who augmented the population. Her union with Jupiter and her identification with Hera were late and greatly altered her personality. Ceres Ceres and her male counterpart, Ceres, who was snuffed out early, were among the oldest of the Italic gods. Ceres was closely associated with Tellus. The purpose of all her festivals was to elicit her blessing on the crops in all their stages, from seeding until harvest, and the fact that the staple grain foods were her gift to the people gave her a peculiarly plebeian standing. Myth represented her as very susceptible to offence and as prompt to punish the offender. Tellus Mater Tellus, or Tellus Mater, seems to have belonged to the same ancient stratum as Ceres and to have been primarily affiliated with her. As her name implies, she was really Mother Earth, but in agriculture she was a personification of the field which receives and cherishes the seed. In time, however, she had to yield place to Ceres, as a double of the Greek Demeter, only to reappear later under the name Terra Mater. In certain rites, she was held to be a divinity of the underworld, for when the bodies of the dead were entrusted, like the seed grain, to her care, she was simply taking back what she herself had given. In myth, she stood, of course, for Gaia. Liber Liber first arose as an epithet of Jupiter to designate the amplitude of his productive powers in the fertilization of the seeds of plants and animals, but later the adjective became detached and invested with personality, the resulting divinity being then identified as Dionysos and appointed as the protector of the vine. Liber's female counterpart, Libera, was equated with Cori, and was thus drawn into the circle of Ceres. Saturnus From the ancient prominence of Saturnus, or the Sower, or in English, Saturn, Italy was often known in myth as Saturnia. The native function of Saturnus is transparent in his name, but this was gradually broadened so as to include practically all agriculture operations. His greater December festival, the Saturnalia, having for its object the germination of the seed just sown, while the sickle, as his chief symbol, marked his intimate relation to harvesting. For some reason unknown to us, he was given a high place in Italic myth, where he was the husband of Ops. Through his association with her, he assimilated some of her Chthonic traits, and further, through her identification as Rhea, was in his turn identified with Cronus, thus coming to be exalted as the ruler of the Golden Age. Consus and Ops The special province of Consus, a purely Italic god, was the safe garnering of the fruits of the field, and the underground location of his altar at Rome is a sort of myth without words symbolizing, as it did, the common custom of storing the grain in pits. 
His most intimate companion in cult was Ops, who seems primarily to have been the personal embodiment of a bountiful harvest, though she assumed the secondary function of protecting the private and public granaries against destruction by fire. Mars The god Mars, or Mavors, or Marspita, or Maspita, was known to all the primitive stalks. In his later career he was certainly the god of war, and in the Roman versions of Greek legends his name regularly replaced that of Ares. But that war was his role from the beginning is not generally admitted, for he may have been a god of vegetation and of the borderlands lying between the farmstead and the wild, and have possessed the double function of fostering the crops and herds and of defending them against the attacks of enemies from without. Just as the Greeks associated the horse and the bull with Poseidon, so the Italians variously connected the woodpecker, the ox, and the wolf with Mars. Faunus No Roman god incorporated in a single person more features of terrestrial nature than did Faunus. There is no doubt that he had been established in the life of the people of the fold and the hamlet from a very remote age, and so familiar were they with him that they could take some of those liberties with his personality such as mythology allows. He was, their legends ran, the kindly spirit of out of doors who caused crop and herd to flourish and who warded off wolves, being Lupercus in this latter respect. It was he who was the speaker of the weird prophetic voices which men heard in the forest, and late legend said that he cast his prophecies in the form of verse, and thus became the inventor of poetry. Yet there was a mischievous side to his nature as well as a serious, for he was the spirit who sent the nightmare, or in Kubo. Fauna, a divinity of fertility, passed now as his wife, now as his sister. Sylvanus Sylvanus seems to have sprung into being from the detached and divinized epithet of either Mars or Faunus, and his domain, true to his name, was the woodland. He bestowed his favour on hunter and shepherd and on all the interests of the husbandman who had won a title to his acres through clearing away the wild timber. He was himself mythologically conceived as a hunter or as an ideal gardener, and many stories of Pan were transferred to him. Diana The earliest of the Italic divinities to be adopted by Rome was Diana, and her cult on the Aventine Hill was simply a transference of her cult at Aresia of Latium. The common belief of a later period that she was the same as Artemis obscured her original nature, but her affiliation at Aresia with the spring nymph Egeria and with Verbius, both divinities of childbirth, arouses the suspicion that her function was a similar one. Venus The process which converted the native Italian Venus into a goddess of love and the Roman double of Aphrodite is very interesting. Her personality seems to have been an efflorescence of a name which first denoted the element of attractiveness in general, then, as it narrowed, this quality in nature, and, in the end, the goddess who elaborated it. To the utilitarian Roman, the chief field of her activity was the market gardens on which the city depended for a large proportion of its foodstuffs, and it was in this capacity, no doubt, that she was recognized as the same as Aphrodite. With this identification, she took over Aphrodite's attribute of love, but in so doing, arrested her own development along its original lines. At an early date in Rome, she was accorded special homage as the mother of Aeneas, and later, as the divine ancestress of the Julian family, the temple of Venus Genetrix built by Julius Caesar, and that of Venus and Rome constructed by Hadrian, being material evidences of a high standing. Cupido became her companion in myth, 
as Eros was that of Aphrodite. Flora Flora was an ancient goddess of springtime and flowers, giving beauty and fragrance to the blossom, sweetness to honey, aroma to wine, and charm to youth. Her April festival was marked by the unstinted and varied use of flowers, and by the practice of pursuing animals often ritually associated with fertility. Fortuna If we follow the successive stages of Fortuna's growth, we must rank her as a nature god. As far back as we can probe into her history, she was apparently the deification of that incalculable element which shapes the conditions of harvest, a time of great anxiety to an agricultural people, while her votaries at Praeneste believed that she controlled the destiny of women in childbirth. She was, in brief, a sort of independent predetermining force in nature. As Virgil represented her, however, she was the incorporate will of the gods, and submission to her decisions was always a moral victory. Her Greek counterpart was generally Taiche, rarely Moira. C. Nature Gods of the Water the importance of springs and streams in the life of the Italian sufficiently accounts for his belief in their individual noumena. The noumena of the springs appeared as kindly young goddesses gifted with song and prophecy and with the power of healing. But they were also, after a manner, sorceresses, though they used their magic to good ends. The best known of these at Rome was Euturna, who, the legend said, was the wife of Ianus and the mother of Fons, or Fountain. The Camenae, nymphs of song and of childbirth, were known as the Roman Muses. One of their number, Carmentis, or Carmenta, like a Greek fate, singing to the newborn child its destiny. Egeria, the nymph brought in from Aresia, had gifts like those of the Camenae. The Romans imagined the noumena of rivers to be benevolent and indulgent old men. Neptunus Neptunus, as the divinity of the element of moisture, belonged to the oldest circle of the Roman gods, and only through his likeness to Poseidon did he become the lord of the sea. His nature confined the observance of his worship to the rural population and the persistence of his festival, the Neptunalia, the purpose of which was to bring moisture to the land, into the fourth century of our era, is one evidence of the tenacious power of nature religion over the masses of the Roman people. D. Nature Gods A fire of the underworld and of disease. Volcanus the fire god Volcanus was far less conspicuous than one would have expected him to be in the land of Vesuvius, and doubtless because the volcano had been quiescent for many centuries prior to 79 AD. Although the god wore the mask of Hephaestus in the Latin renderings of Greek myth, he was by nature only partially qualified to do so. In the old Roman group of gods, he was the spirit of destructive rather than of useful fire, and was reputed to be of an irascible disposition which always needed placation, whence the presence of many docks and valuable stores at Ostia led to the wide extension of his worship in that place. Videovis Left to himself, and with his imagination unprodded by the Greek spirit of wonder, the Roman gave little time to speculating on the lot of man after death. His chief interest was in the living and those yet to be born, so that one is not surprised to find his divinities of the underworld few and only vaguely out outlined. The chief one was Vediovis, or Veovis, or Vedius, who seems to have been given his place in the lower world largely for the reason that the logic of the Roman religious system called for a spiritual and physical opposite to Jupiter. 
Little is known of him beyond the fact that he was invoked in oaths along with Tellus. Febris The disease which the Romans feared the most was, of course, malaria, which was the fever of Febris par excellence. And so concrete and uniform were its manifestations that we utterly lose the Romans' point of view if we regard Febris, the divinity, as born of an abstraction. This holds equally true of the offshoots of Febris, Dia Tertiana and Dia Quartana, the one standing for the malarial chills, which, according to our mode of reckoning, return every second day, the other for those which recur every third day. A. Gods of Human Society Ianus So obscure was the origin of Ianus that the Roman poets took all manner of liberties with him, using the joint appearance of his head and of a ship on coins as data for a mythical history of this god. He was, said one of them, an aboriginal king who ruled on Mount Ianiculum, at first sharing his throne with a noble whose name was Camis, but later, when Jupiter's divine regime began, being banished along with Saturnus and taking up his abode in Latium. In another account, he was represented as having come to Latium from the land of Paraboyans, together with his sister-wife Camis, who bore him three sons, one of them being Tiburnius, after whom the Tiber was named. The legends did not stint Ianus with wives. Besides Camis, he is said to have married either the water nymph Venelia, and by her to have become the father of Canens, or the water nymph Euturna, who bore to him Fons, or Fontus. Again, he is said to have conceived a passion for a certain divinity Karna, whom he seized in a grotto, and after a long pursuit, promising to appoint her the goddess of hinges, should she yield to him. Upon her compliance he renamed her Cardo, or Cardia, and gave her the white throne with which to banish evil from doorways. Of all the theories to account for the origin of Ianus, none is more probable than that which comprehends him as a personality gradually evolved from a private ritual of a magical order designed to drive evil influences from the doors of dwellings. The very vagueness of this god, even with the Romans themselves, indicates that their interest was rather in the concrete values associated with the doorway and in the practical expedients necessary in guarding it. As the state was simply an enlarged domestic circle, it was not unnatural that Ianus should be connected with the ancient gates or arches in the forum which bore his name, and there, in the late Republican period, stood an image of the god with two faces, one of which was turned toward the east and the other toward the west. This intimation that his domain lay both before and behind him may have sprung from the very obvious fact that every entrance has two sides. From being a god of entrances, it was not a far cry to become a deity of beginnings, and as such he was invoked at the beginning of each year, each month, and each day. The prominence of his name and of his epithet, Pater, in ancient ceremonial formulae, attests his great age. Vesta By reason of her fixed character, Vesta had no place in formal myth. She was the Newman of the herd, first of the home and then of the state. And since the functions and symbolism of the hearth never changed from century to century, neither could Vista vary a jot or a little from her original conception. Any alteration would have broken the thread of continuity in the religious sentiment of the Roman as a member of a family and as a citizen. In the home, Vesta typified and protected the life of the family. The food in the larder, destined to be subjected to the heat of the hearth flame, was under her care. The matron was a priestess. The temple, or better, the house, of Vesta, in the forum was nothing less than the home and fireside of the state, 
and on its hearth the six Vestal Virgins prepared sacrificial offerings in behalf of the state, with food taken from the sacred larder. While the inviolability of the home and the integrity of the state were pictured in the purity of Vesta herself and of her virgins. Her title Mater was suggestive of her graciousness. Deep in others, Laris. Also closely connected with family life were the deep in Athis, the numerous divinities of the penis, or larder, though they were so dimly conceived that they were endued with neither sex nor personality, their plurality being doubtless derived from the variety and the changing character of the stock of foodstuffs. From the time of Julius Caesar and Augustus, the mythical idea of the Trojan origin of the Penates prevailed. The Laris are linked with the Penates in popular phrase, jointly constituting a synonym for household property. But at the outset, apparently, there was only one Lar to a household, under the protecting Newman of the allotment of land on which the actual building stood. At length its function was broadened so as to include the house, and in imperial times the name became pluralized and acquired a character as a synonym of house. When Ovid wrote that the Laris were the children of the outraged Lara, or Dia Tacita, and Mercury, he was indulging his fancy. As a matter of fact, they were sometimes held to be the Roman counterparts of the Coritis, the Corybantes, or the Dactyloi. Minerva Any complexity there was in the personality of the static divinity, Minerva, was due to the influence of Athene, with whom she was identified. For in her primitive estate, she seems to have been merely the goddess of the few and simple arts of an undeveloped rustic community. The Romans probably got her from Faleri prior to its fall in 241 BC, and after the institution of the so-called Calendar of Numa, and established her in a temple in the Aventine as the patroness of the crafts and the guilds. Her inclusion in the Capitoline triad, beside Jupiter and Uno, may have resulted from a conscious attempt to reproduce in Rome a group like that of Zeus, Hera and Athene. Abstract Gods The inelastic character of the Roman's religious thinking is nowhere more clearly brought out than in the circle of his abstract divinities. For Pavor, or Panic, Pax, or Peace, Concordia, or harmony, spes, or hope, and the like, were each fixed personalities of one trait and one trait only, a circumstance which naturally shut them out from narrative myth. The field for which they were by nature suited was that of stereotyped symbolism, and only so far as an accepted religious symbol is a myth may they be considered as mythological personages. They and their several symbols are too numerous for us to discuss here. G. Momentary and Departmental Gods The great host of the Romans' momentary and departmental divinities, commonly known to scholars as Sondergotter, seem at first glance to be an argument which disproves the lack of pliability in the Romans' habits of religious thought. As a matter of fact, however, they confirm the reality of this characteristic, for as a class they are nothing more than an aggregate of the most simply conceived units which sustain to one another the same immediate relations that exist between the practical interests and activities of a primitive people. Some of these divinities, such as Mesor or Harvester, Convector or Garnerer, and Sarito, or Vida, spiritualize human acts, while others spiritualize certain processes of nature which are conspicuous either in themselves or in their results. A chosen view of this latter order will be ample for the purpose of illustration. Seya, Segesta, Nodutas, Patelana, and Matura are numina 
that preside successively over the sowing and sprouting of the corn, the formation of the joints on its stem, the building of leaf and flower, and finally, the ripening of straw and ear. Similarly, each stage of a child's growth from conception to adult stature is guarded by a newman, whose function is transparent in its commonly accepted name. In brief, no natural process of moment to the Roman's well-being fails to receive recognition as a divinity. Gods of Foreign Origin Apollo Apollo was from the beginning, frankly, alone from the Greek world. He was brought to Rome in the 5th century by way of Cumae as a god of healing to put an end to a great plague which threatened to exterminate the populace, and in his train came the books of the Sibylline oracles. In the Augustan age, the average Roman knew him only as the god of poetry and music, a role which was first assigned him in Rome when translations of Greek literary works began to attain popularity. Augustus chose him as the divine patron of his regime and dedicated to him a beautiful temple on the Palatine. Aesculapius The outbreak of a pestilence at Rome in 292 BC turned the Romans to a consultation of the Sibylline books where they discovered directions enjoining them to send a deputation of citizens to the healing shrine of Asclepius at Epidaurus, the convoys bringing back a serpent as a living symbol of the god, and at the same time instructions for establishing the new worship. It happened that when their ship reached the city, the serpent leaped overboard and swam to the island in the Tiber, where the new shrine was built the god's name being given the Latin name of Aesculapius. When Salus, originally an abstract divinity of well-being in general, became recognized as the same as Hygieia, or health, the matter-of-fact Roman mind made her the official consort of the new god of healing. Mercurius In the early 5th century, on the occasion of a failure of crops which necessitated the importation of foreign foodstuffs, the Romans borrowed one face of the character of Hermes, and exhorting it to the dignity of Godhead, used it to protect the maritime routes which the grain ships must follow. Naturally, this face was the favour which Hermes accorded to trade and traders, and Mercurius, the name of the new god, connected as it is with the Latin word mercies, or merchandise, and mercator, or tradesman, served as a permanent register of his function. While Mercurius always took the place of Hermes in the Romanized Greek legends, his character in cult remained unaltered through the centuries. In art he was originally distinguished by the chief symbols of Hermes, the caudaceous, the pouch, and the winged hat. Castor and Pollux The worship of Castor and Polyducus as Castor and Pollux came to Italy at so early a date that when the Romans accepted it, apparently from Tusculum, they did so under the impression that it was of Italic origin. But the outstanding features of these divinities at Rome, their association with horses and lakes, and their power to give help in time of need, were brought with them from Greece. In myth it is recorded that they suddenly appeared at the battles of Lake Regulus, Pydna, and Verona, just in time to bring victory to the Roman cause. After the battle of Lake Regulus, they were seen to water their horses in the basins of the fountain of Euterna, and on this spot the citizens erected a shrine known as the Temple of the Castors or the Temple of the Castor. Hercules Under the name of Hercules, the Greek Heracles was admitted into the Roman family of gods, as though he were a native Italic divinity. At his very ancient altar, the Ara Maxima, near the Forum Boreum, or the Cattle Market, 
He was worshipped as a god, powerful to aid commerce and other practical pursuits. Whence, accordingly, tithes of profits in trade and of the booty of war were dedicated to him. The popularity which Heracles enjoyed in Greece, owing to his unparalleled ability to bring things to pass, so inspired the Roman imagination that almost out of whole cloth it manufactured mythological forms to glorify the adopted Hercules. Not only did he have an intrigue with a certain Acca Larentia, but he was the husband now of Iuno, now of Evander's daughter, now of Rhea, now of Fauna. And by the last three in this order, he became the father of Pallas, Aventinus, and Latinus. Among his mighty feats were numbered his retention of the waters of Lake Avernus in their basin by means of a dam, and his slaughter of some threatening giants at Cumae. When he was returning eastward through Italy with the cattle of Gyronius, we are told, some of his herd were stolen by a native shepherd named Cacus, apparently an aboriginal fire god, and driven backward into a cave. But, although at first puzzled by the inverted tracks, Hercules at length succeeded in locating and recovering the animals and in killing the chief. He then made himself known to Evander, an Arcadian refugee ruling on the Palatine, who received him with unbounded hospitality and dedicated to him the Ara Maxima, the ceremonies observed at this altar by Evander becoming the model of those used in the worship of Hercules through succeeding centuries. This Pater This Pater, also known as Orcus, and Proserpina were both Greek the name this being simply a translation of wealthy, and that of Orcus, a faulty transliteration of the oath, sworn in the name of Hades, while Proserpina is obviously an adaptation of Persephone. To the Roman, this Peter was the chief god of the lower world in his function as king of the departed, and Orcus was the same deity in his role as the inexorable reaper, or, occasionally, as that divinity who takes pity on suffering mortals and gently bears them away to their long rest. The nature of Orcus being so readily grasped by the Roman mind and its slavery to fact that he was the more popular of the two forms. Magna Mater In the midst of the Romans' despair of receiving help against Hannibal from their accepted gods, they turned, in obedience to a sibylline oracle, to the Asiatic Magna Mater, the great mother of the gods. With the permission of Atalus of Pergamon, they brought to Rome from Phrygia the meteoric stone which embodied her and then established a festival for the reenactment of the rites which characterized her worship in the East. She accomplished the purpose for which she had been brought and drove Hannibal out of Italy. But in spite of his gratitude to her, the sedate Roman never became thoroughly accustomed to the wild abandon of her votaries. Myths of the Early Days of Rome The Aeneid of Virgil In their national epics, Naevius and Aeneas had made the glory of the city their central interest and had popularized the idea that the founders of Rome were of Trojan stock. Virgil took over these motives and, by injecting into them his own deep love of his land and his broodings on the life and destiny of man, and by lavishing on them his chaste and poetical skill, produced the greatest of all Roman ethics, the Aeneid, which tells the story of the wanderings of Trojan Aeneas. Aeneas, or Greek Aeneas, as we have read, was the son of Anchises and Venus, that is, Aphrodite. Amid the confusion attendant on the sack of Troy, he made his way with his father and little son, Eulus, to the shelter of the wooded heights near the city, and there gathered about him a number of fugitives, whom he led in making preparations to sail away to a strange land and found a new home. After many busy weeks they set out, first crossing to Thrace, 
and then steering southward to Delos, where, at the shrine of Apollo, they were bidden by the oracle to seek the motherland of their ancestors and there make their abode. Believing that this referred to Crete, Aeneas led his followers thither, but after the little colony had suffered many misfortunes, he was warned in a dream to establish it instead in the western land of Hesperia, that is, Italy. In the quest of this country, he again set sail with his followers, and many were the vicissitudes of their long voyage. They came successively to the island of the Harpies, to the home of Helenus and Andromache on the coast of Epirus, and to the land of the Cyclopes, where they saw the blinded Polyphemus. In an endeavour to avoid Scylla and Charybdis, they hugged the southern shores of Sicily with the intention of doubling the western extremity of the island. But Iuno espied them, and, unable to forget that they belonged to the Trojan race which he hated, roused a great storm that drove them on the coast of Carthage. At this time, Carthage was ruled by a Tyrian queen named Dido, who welcomed the fugitives into her court, entertaining them for many months as though they were a company of kings, and at her request, Aenus told the story of the fall of his city and of his perilous voyage from land to land in his search for a home. His personal charms won her love, and she offered to share her kingdom with him. But when, weary of wandering longer and despairing of finding his destined land, Aeneas was on the point of yielding to her passionate importunities, Jupiter, through Mercury, roused him from his lethargy and turned his face once more towards the ships and the sea. Reembarking, the Trojans sailed northward and under the protection of Neptune reached the shores of Hesperia, near Cumae, the home of the Sibyl. Here, like Odysseus in Chimeria, Aeneas made the descent into Hades and saw many dire monsters and the shadowy troops of the dead. After conversing with the shades of some of whom he had known in life, he turned to make his way upward to the light, his path leading him through Elysium, where he found the shade of his father and Jesus, who had died since the departure from Troy. By him he was led into the spacious vale of forgetfulness and was shown the vast assemblage of souls that were waiting to be implanted in some human body and given life upon earth, while Anchises also revealed to him the trials which he had yet to experience in establishing his colony in Italy and the glories of the great nation into which the exiles were destined to grow. Pondering these things in his heart, Aeneas pursued his way back to earth. From Cumae, Aeneas sailed northward until he cast anchor in the mouth of the Tibe off the coast of Latium at a time when the king of this country was Latinus, the son of Faunus and a grandson of Saturn. Recognizing in Aeneas the man who, according to a prophecy, was to be the husband of his only daughter, Lavinia, he entered into a political alliance with him and promised to make him his son-in-law, thereby annulling Lavinia's betrothal to Turnus, the king of the neighbouring Rutulians. Through the interference of the implacable Iuno, this led to a long war between Turnus and Latinus, but though the latter was killed in one of the early struggles, his forces, aided by Aenus and his men, succeeded in winning a victory. Turnus, defeated but not discouraged, called to his assistance Mezentius, the Etruscan king, and to such an extent did he threaten the supremacy of the Trojans that the latter associated themselves with a band of Greek colonists who, under the leadership of Evander and his son Pallas, were living on the hills destined to be included in the city of Rome. In the conflicts that ensued, Pallas was slain by Turnus, and later, Mezentius and Turnus fell at the hand of Aeneas, the Trojans achieving, through the death of this last foe, a victory which gave them undisputed possession of the land. At this point, the narrative of the Aeneid ends, leaving the reader to infer that the nuptials of Aeneas and Lavinia were promptly consummated. 
events subsequent to those of the Aeneid. After his marriage, Aeneas founded in Letium a new city which he called Lavinium after his wife, and when he died a short time later, his subjects, regarding him as a god, gave him the title of Jupiter Indigis. About thirty years subsequent to the foundation of Lavinium, Ascanius, the son whom Lavinia bore to Aeneas, withdrew a portion of its population and established the colony of Alba Longa, over which he and his descendants ruled for several successive generations. At length a quarrel arose between Numitor and Amulius, two brothers in the direct line of descent, as to which of them should reign, and Amulius, the younger and less scrupulous, getting the upper hand, banished his brother, and, in order to wipe out that branch of the family, forced his niece, Rhea Silvia, to take the vows of a vestal. But his wicked designs were frustrated by destiny, for the god Mars looked with favour on the maiden, and by him she became the mother of twin boys, Romulus and Remus. When Amulius learned of their birth, he cruelly had them set adrift in a basket on the flooded Tiber, but when the water subsided, they were left on dry land and were found and nursed by a she-wolf. As it happened, the king's shepherd, Fastulus, came across them in the wild lands and taking them to his home, reared them as his own sons. When they had become men, they earned of their relationship to Amulius and of his wicked deeds, and accordingly, with a band of youths they attacked him in his palace, slew him, and restored the kingdom of Alba Longa to their grandfather, Numito. Unable to serve their connections with the locality where they had spent their boyhood, they jointly founded a new city there. But when it became necessary to decide the question as to which of them should rule, they fell to quarrelling, until finally, in an outburst of anger, Romulus killed Remus, and, now without a rival, assumed the title and the powers of king. To perpetuate his own name, he called the city Rome.